Hobbyist board gamers, as a rule, tend to believe that bigger is better. So, to quote The Wire, Are you happy now, my friend, who I respect a great deal? This is Western Empires, a literal royal rumble with classical kings and queens slamming their civilizations against each other, making a mosh pit of their populations. This is a game for between five and nine players that might take you as long as 12 hours to finish, making this the first game that we've reviewed with a very real chance of being reported missing by your family. And here's the crazy part. It's about to get twice as big. Together with Eastern Empires, Western Empires can be combined to create Mega Empires, a colossal gaming experience for up to 18 players that can still be played within a single day. Now, some of you might be thinking that it is perhaps a bit irresponsible for Shut Up and Sit Down to be reviewing a game that squeezes this many players around a table while the world is still battling COVID-19. So, let me tease my conclusion early. This is not a game that I'm going to be telling you to buy. I think it is a flawed and fascinating curio that will make for a very interesting review. Also, before we start, you may notice we have a new table. It was given to us by the fine folks at Geek & Sun. It's got one of those sunken velvety chambers as if a dining table had sex with a coffin. And I'm going to be talking about it and also my thoughts on gaming tables in general at the end of this video. And with that, I can begin this triple review of Western Empires slash Eastern Empires slash the combined game of Mega Empires, because as you'll soon see, no matter how many people you're playing with, you will have quite a similar experience. Your day will begin at about 8000 BC, which is approximately when I last had a haircut. You're going to have a civilization and some components, and your first challenge will be figuring out how and where to sit without being accosted by your opponent's elbows and armpits. I'm serious, if your table is any smaller than this one, trying to lay out this game is like doing Satan's own version of Feng Shui. The good news is that once you're seated, you'll be able to start managing your embryonic armies quite quickly, because the rules explanation in this game is mostly unbelievably simple. Mostly. At the start of each round, everyone's population doubles like so many asexual cells, and everyone can move every square exactly one space. You can even bundle your little folks into enemy territory and they can get along. Until there's no food. Every space can support this many people. At the end of the round, if you're there alone, your population is culled down to that number. And only if you're there with somebody else do you fight, taking turns to remove people until the total is below that number. I just taught you how army management, movement, and combat works in less time than it takes to pee. And even weirder than that comparison, this mouthful of rules does all of the heavy lifting required to evoke the ancient world with unstoppable invasions flowing out from some forgotten corner of the map, kings being crushed into a historical footnote, and unassailable empires rising only for one goofy leader to render them vulnerable, and all the peoples around them circling and then picking apart their territory like vultures. But if you're not good at war games, don't worry. What if I were to tell you that you could win Western Empires by being the best salesperson? But first, I need to introduce you to your Horrible boss. This is the archaeological succession track, and every round, everyone can advance one rung on this unrepentantly mean monkey bar if they meet the requirements at the top. And at the end of the day, when one or some of you slide over the line with the determination of a baseballist sliding into home base, the game is finally over and everyone gets points representing uh, what future generations think of you. For example, I bet you, watching this, have heard of ancient Egypt. But have you heard of ancient Hatti? With their worship of the mother goddess Kataha? No, you haven't. And it's not because you're uneducated. It's because they were losers. Unfortunately, even on the basic side, this track is gonna make losers of a lot of players. So if there's one thing you should bring to Western Empires besides a packed lunch, it's a good attitude or a willingness to use the rule in the manual for players who just want to leave this game, their entire civilization noping out of the continent and shuttering like a failed sandwich shop. 
To start with, the AST just needs you to own a certain number of cities, and that's not too bad. You can move six troops into one space, and then they can be optionally collapsed into a city, which is bad only because it doesn't produce new population units, but it's good because it requires an opponent to send at least seven soldiers just to crack them back open like a grizzly piñata full of angry candy. So there is wisdom in building cities on your borders to create a wall between you and an opponent, but there's also wisdom in keeping your cities as far away from your barbarous opponents as possible. That's because after it demands cities, the stern doorman of the AST will not let your people pass unless you can flash a certain number of advance cards from your personal advance deck. And this is where Western Empires becomes like no game you've ever played. Advance cards, which in and of themselves do very little or sometimes even nothing, are bought using sets of resource cards. Now, every round for every city you have, you're gonna get a random resource card and then everybody gets to trade with everybody else to try and get sets. In a little more detail, one player who will very quickly regret signing up for this job is gonna give every other player one card from each deck for each city they have. So if you have three cities, you get one card from decks one, two, and three. Then you're gonna play something a lot like classic card game Pit, except with a higher possibility of being traded a card that means thousands of people are dead. Within these decks are better and better resources, but worse and worse, calamity cards. There are minor calamities, major ones, tradable ones, non-tradable ones, and whichever players get stuck with those calamities get walloped by them at the end of the trading phase. But what really powers this trading game is you're not swapping individual cards. Instead, a set has to be a minimum of three cards. And it gets better. When you're talking about what you exchange, you only have to tell the truth about the first two cards. That can be dodgy if you're trading three. Now what if I told you this is a clay, an iron, a fruit, another iron, and an ochre? How much of that am I telling the truth about? Probably very little. Let's imagine that you're Rome, sat unenviably in the middle of this grand melee. You got dealt some fish, and you don't hear anyone else asking for fish, so you think, maybe I could be the fish set person. So you talk to Iberia, you say, got any fish? And they say, yeah, I've got a fish, a fruit, and an ochre. So you trade some cards and, oh no, it's a fish, a fruit, and a slave revolt. <gasps> they were lying, but don't let it show on your face. Don't swear at them, keep your cool. And maybe, just maybe, you'll be able to trade that slave revolt with some other junk to Carthage, your mortal enemies across the Mediterranean. And if they suffer the calamity, that might just set you up for an invasion. This literal trading card game does such a nice job of breaking up the day. Everybody gets to lurk up, away from the merciless explosion of tiny squares and brutal wars on the board that you're all worrying about, and you get to make each other feel better by helping one another compute sets. And you can laugh at the ridiculousness of lying about what you're trading all the time. The first time I played this, we were all cracking up because the Assyrians in that game got access to a bunch of cities and therefore higher numbered decks. So they started saying things to the Mediterranean like, does anybody have any wine? And we were dying laughing because we'd never seen any wine. We didn't know what it was. Wine, we were saying to her. Is that a kind of bone? So there's your primer on what this game is. Populations double, you move, you fight, you build cities, you get trade goods from the cities, you trade, some players get devastated by calamities, you drop populations down to the level the region can support, and then all or some of you advance along the AST. Or actually, I guess none of you might advance along the AST if you all screwed up which would mean you just played a 40 minute round and the game is no closer to being over. I really cannot overstate how long this game is. Trying to guide a table full of new players through this, it reminds me of some of the stressful holidays we've all had, you know? Someone's getting cranky, someone's getting hungry, and none of us can get off the tour bus because we don't want to admit that we failed at leisure. But like a holiday, Western Empires is at least going to be memorable. And if you're lucky and stay positive and you are very organized, it might even be magical. And for certain millennia of certain games, it has been magical for me.
When we reviewed Root, I talked about the pleasure that game gives you by giving you your little role to play in an ecosystem. And in Root, that was all this crazy asymmetry with all the factions climbing on top of each other. In Western Empires, you're playing your role in a bigger thing, but the bigger thing is the world. In, it doesn't matter how many people you play with, whether it's five or nine or 18, your civilization is gonna be spending all day warring with the two, three, four, maybe five players around you. Everyone else at the table, you're not going to interact with them. Imagine that. Imagine playing a game with some people all day and you do not talk to them. And yet, this is backwards, but this is where Western Empires gets its magic from. It's this idea that you're playing a war game, not just against some players, but in a world that is bigger than your comprehension. I swear, on those few times that you'll have some trade goods you really need to shift and no one's interested and you stand up to walk away from the table all the way around it to trade with the Celts sat six feet away from you, only then might you look at their corner of the globe and go, hey, do you have any ochre? What is happening here? And then you'll have your mind blown by the war that's happening that you completely forgot about and then you'll walk back, sit down and completely forget about it again. That's the sense of scale we're dealing with here, and it's so exciting. But if it's oh so easy to stake out the reasons to play Western Empires, it is sadly even easier to point out the reasons not to play it. First off, let's talk about movement. Uh, you know, the manual encourages you to move things simultaneously where possible. It's easy going like that, but as soon as you have borders, which all players will very quickly have, all the time, you're gonna to wanna to know which of you has to move first. And the manual says, it's easy as well. Just whoever has the biggest population. And you say, but how do we know who has the biggest population? And the game says, it's easy. You do an actual census of Europe every round. You count literally every token on the board to update all the other tokens so you know when it's your turn to move tokens. Now, admittedly, I did quite enjoy the census phase, but that's only because I liked to yell, hey everybody, census, and see all of my friends sag ever so slightly at how they'd chosen to spend their Sunday. But that's because I'm a bad man and your mileage may vary. But the census is just a little bit of friction compared to what I'm really afraid of seeing happen to someone around the table, which is them just losing. Because of the cruelly mathematical combat, if another empire is bigger than you, they can, home every thousand years, hum, eat more and more of your lunch. And worse, the less territory you have, the less you have to do, which means the slower the game is gonna feel. And that's one thing if you misplayed the strategic game and so you're losing because of that. But frankly, you might be losing because you just got whomped by a calamity. Now, the calamities are supposed to be a catch-up mechanism because they get worse the later deck you draw from. So people with more cities are slightly more likely to draw worse calamities but they might not draw them. This whole system, it's like trying to redistribute wealth by laying a minefield in a bank. Let's say Egypt's doing really well and draws an epidemic. Egypt trades that epidemic to, you know, the enemies at Carthage. Ah, oh, that's a lovely moment. But Carthage then trades it to the Celts, who were already in last place, and now they're in last place, and have an epidemic to deal with. Oh, that is awful, it's so unlucky. Everyone around the table is gonna be saying platitudes to that player, now there is no way in heck they can win. And they have to sit here and keep playing for eight hours? Listen, in this situation, I would instruct that Celt player to leave, put in all the little out of play tokens. But let me stop and repeat that. This is a board game where things happen where I would encourage a player to walk out of my door while the rest of us kept playing. No, I'm not gonna do that. I mean, I would, but I, I would don't want to. But whether a player ends up with a bad board state because they were unlucky or not very strategic or emotionally checked out or all three, that would be fun. That player, let's say it's Rome, is then left like the turd on a doorstep for all the other players around them who have a decision that I hate making in games. And that the decision is either do we leave Rome alone? That player is having a horrible time. I don't want to make it worse for the good of the day we're all having. Or do you say, well, this is the game. I'm going to take as much of their territory as I can because you can't spell fire sale without fire. Also, one of the late game calamities is just to move your AST marker backwards. 
You thought missing a turn was a bad mechanic? That has all the appeal of your computer crashing and you losing your work. You know what? It's worse. Because if that happens to the person in first place, that elongates the game by 40 minutes. The computer just crashed and lost everyone's work. I think I would be a lot more forgiving of a lot of this if Western Empires was just shorter. And this is not gonna gel with the community of players who have been enjoying this game since the first edition was hewn out of rock all the way back in the year 1980. But listen, I understand what this game gets from its improbable scale. It's like nothing else in the marketplace. I do not understand what this game gets from forcing you to enjoy it from 10 a.m. until 11 p.m. Guys, here's a sign, right? If you find yourself writing a section in the manual on what happens if players leave, maybe instead change the design so players don't want to leave. Just practically speaking, with a game like this, where it is easier to get nine world leaders around my table than nine people who are definitely gonna enjoy this, what I want after that point is flexibility. I wanna to fall to my knees at the altar of this game and say, oh, I did as you asked, my lord. I gathered eight other people who could understand the difference between unit movement and ship movement. And then I wanted to say, Well done, my prophet. How much time do you have to play? Instead, it says, Cool, you can play literally all day or slightly longer than that. Oh, thank you. Uh, wait, are there really no other options? There's also the short game that takes just six to eight hours. Oh, but that's perfect. It is perfect and only recommended for experienced players. Yeah, I might just go see if Marduk is accepting new followers instead. Silence! Okay, you know what else? If your map squeezes 50% of the players into just 10% of your board, use a different map projection! So that is Western Empires, a game that brings history to life while feeling like a bit of a historical throwback itself. A time machine that disrespects the very time you have to play it. This then is a design I would only recommend you investigate if, like me, you will put in a preposterous amount of time and money and energy just for a few crumbs of table gaming magic. And you know what? I don't regret any of the games of this I've played. And if, when Eastern Empires finally comes out, you were to invite me to a full 18 player game, I like to think I might just say, maybe. Maybe. It depends on which civilization I get. If I get to be on the edge where there's loads of space, awesome. If I'm the Celts, great. If you want to squeeze me in the middle with all the other players, that's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend too much of the game reaching over the table. It's gonna suck. It's not gonna be worth it. So that is the review over, which means it's time for me to talk about this new table that we got sent by Geek and Sun. This is their Megan model. It's the bigger version. It's in dark wood. And currently there is a Kickstarter running for these exact tables, offering them at a price that is good. So here's the deal. They said they would give us this table in return for us talking about it. But they said very strictly at Geek and Sun that we could say whatever we want. So I'm gonna start by saying whatever I want. I'm gonna say I did not get the appeal of these gaming tables. So if you've not seen one before, let me press the James Bond button. What we have here, oh God, moving these slats is quite a lot of work, is a sunken recess chamber in which oh, you can put your board games on a sort of felt interior. I'm probably gonna fade until I've done this because no one wants to listen to me grunt. Ta-da! So, as I said, uh, I didn't get the point of this. I was like, why would you spend all this money on this dramatically expensive luxury product to have a playing area, which is of course smaller than the size of the table itself. If you put a game on this, it's very difficult to use this kind of tightrope around the edge. Worse, you can't even really put drinks on it because that's obviously a disaster waiting to happen. It either gets knocked one way or it gets knocked the other way and then water goes on the felt. Ah, goodness gracious. Also, this might be a time to mention that some of these gaming tables don't even function as dining tables. If you put the slats on, then you spill a drink, that liquid might fall through the slats onto the felt, ruining it. So, first things first, if you're getting one of these, I would say make sure that it does actually work as a dining table. 
So yeah, with all of that, you know, uh, in my face, I was like, why would anybody buy this? Turns out, after living with one of these for a little bit, I've completely changed my tune. In the Marie Kondo style, this table sparks joy in my life every time I use it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why. Um, so first things first, this is the biggest thing for me as someone who loves card games. There's a reason that casinos use felt and it is because felt is a fabulous surface to play card games on. In addition to there being all this nice friction that lets you do card tricks and fun deals, in addition to cards not being able to fly off the table, um, which is also, of course, why it's really fun to roll dice on a gaming table because they don't fall off. It's like craps, you can be like, bam. Basically, I like gaming tables because they make my house feel a bit more like a casino. Um, but the real reason cards are nice on felt is because you can pick them up. You ever had that experience where you just can't pick up a card because you can't get your fingers under it? Obviously in felt, you can just pick up anything you want and it is always bam, 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 super easy. I absolutely adore that. Uh, the other reason, not the other reason, another reason, Felt also has this nice feature of making games kind of pop. You know, you put a board on here, and not only is it like on this colorful background, but because it's slightly sunken, it just feels a bit more like a museum exhibit or something. I don't know, it's hard to describe. Also, this really blew my mind. I read a lot of manuals when I'm playing board games, and of course, usually if you've got loads of bitty tokens, you have to read the manual like that, and it sucks. But of course now, Na 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 na. I can rest the manual on something, I can browse it and know that anything underneath is not getting knocked about. So overall, um, this Geek and Sun table has uh, kind of put a bit of egg on my face. I did not think I would enjoy it half as much as I do. Um, it's also just a nice sturdy object. I can't speak for all gaming tables, but this one, it's so big and heavy, it doesn't go anywhere, which means it feels like feels luxurious, it feels nice. Even with the slats on, it's just a lovely table to sit at. Um, however, uh, you know, the real question is not, do I like this table? I do, it's lovely, but I got it for free. So the question I wanna try and help you answer maybe is whether you should buy it. But ultimately these tables are so expensive, I don't feel confident telling anyone to buy it, unless money's absolutely no object to you. Instead, I would say, well, the only thing I can really, which is I like mine. Uh, I would, however, say that if before you buy it, before you do anything like that, maybe try and go to a board game convention to sit at one of these tables, you know, see how much you like it. The only other sort of advice I can provide is my favorite feature of this table is this one bit of wood. Let me show you what it does. The reason I like it is because what you do is you can have a recess that is not necessarily all the whole thing, right? You can wall off part of it, you can wall off as much as you want. You can have half of it being a dining table and half of it being recessed. And then dice and cards aren't gonna roll under that thing and it feels like, it's just nice to have this felt line playing space. And then it's even more nice for it to be the perfect size of the game. So that's really cool. The only other commercial advice I would give you is, I don't know, even, Here's the thing, you, you can't have drinks on this thing. That's the floor. And the way they fix that floor is by having a variety of cup holders. This is actually also a token holder, but it's the only thing I have that hold mugs. And then they fit into this rail system around the edge of the table. So there you go, and then you've got your cup holder. I dislike having to pay extra for all of these just to be able to maybe hold all of your friend's drinks. Uh, and I, well, counterpoint, as much as I dislike having to buy those, I do personally use them. And these little token holders, I really actually do like. This is this was a very disappointing discovery for me personally, but that you get something like this, which is so dorky and it's got like two sections for components and it can hold cards there. Oh yeah, that's a fun bonus. This thing, this rail around the edge of the Megan that's designed to hold um, the sheaves of wood actually also functions as a card holder, which is cute for those few people out there who actually like card holders. Um, but yeah, these token holders, I also do use them. You know, when, uh, when I was receiving this table, you know, they asked, do you want these? And I said, not really, but they force them on me and I use them all the time. So that's another sort of bit of high ground I'm having to abandon in the face of these tables actually being quite nice. So there you have it. Um, I don't feel enormously confident recommending this table because it's the only one I've had. 
Uh, <laughs> I can only say I like it. I don't feel comfortable recommending gaming tables in general because they're insanely expensive. And candidly, maybe this is the most important thing I will say. Even though I got this table for free and it's bringing me pleasure all the time, um, I wouldn't pay for it. I, I, I'm, I'm not like, you know, broke anymore like I was in my 20s, but I couldn't justify dropping, you know, 1,000 or one, one and a half thousand pounds on a table and a bunch of accessories um, that just bring me just a little bit of joy every time I use it. Um, but for those of you who really like the idea of these tables more than me, for those of you who have more money than me, I would say, yeah, maybe, maybe one of these tables would be a fun investment for you. Uh, final, final, final thing I'll say. These chairs, which are also from Geek & Son, they're not cheap, but they are very comfortable, super comfortable. Honestly, it kind of makes me feel sad for my ass cheeks and lower back that they had to sit on those IKEA folding tables you've been seeing in our reviews from for the last seven years, because this is so good. Mm. Thank you very much for watching everybody. And a link to the Kickstarter for this table is in the description of this video. Mm. Mm.